And Professor Michael Sadowski is going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you all. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Sadowski, and I'm the director of the University of Minnesota's Biotechnology Institute. And I'm a professor in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, and the Biotechnology Institute, as well as the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. Um, I'm also a member of the executive committee of the University's Consortium of Law and Values, the organizer of today's conference. I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Professor Barbara Spellman from the University of Virginia to speak on the challenges of journals encouraging sound science. And as you just heard from our John just recently, there is a lot of pressure now on journals as well to get it right, so to speak. And conf confounding this is the proliferation of what has been termed predatory journals and a reduction in the linkage of our journals to our societies. So relative to that, I just want to disclose too that I've been an editor-in-chief of a microbiology journal for Microbiology Spectrum as well as an editorial board member for 33 years for a journal called Applied and Environmental Microbiology. And there's been challenges that have been cropping up in these journals as the pressure to publish has been increasing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Barbara Spellman, who's a PhD and JD professor of law and a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. She received a law degree from NYU and her doctorate in cognitive psychology from UCLA. Her research and teaching are at the intersection of cognitive and social psychology and law, and she's a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and the Society for Experimental Social Psychology. In 2011 until 2015, she served as the editor-in-chief of Perspectives on Psychological Science, a theory and review journal which has published over 100 articles on the replication crisis that we just heard about and scientific reform. She currently is chair of TOP, which stands for Transparency and Openness Promotion, and she's chair of the Coordinating Committee for TOP, which designs and promotes good publication practice and is part of the Center for Open Science. So with that, I'd like to introduce Barbara Spellman to please come up to the platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's always um, a pleasure and a bit intimidating to follow John when he's speaking. It's also a bit depressing, um, <laughs> but I hope to cheer at least some of you up a little bit. So in 2009, I was asked a question from the Association for Psychological Science, an organization of 25,000 members of research psychologists would you like to be the editor-in-chief of Perspectives on Psychological Science? As we heard, it's sort of an eclectic journal, does theory review. It really does anything that no of the, uh, none of the other journals at APS do. And I said, sure, this ought to be fun. And so 2010, I did what every incoming editor does, which is you write a nice little letter that thanks the previous editor. And you say, you know, you have some ambitions about some new kinds of articles that you'd like to. Little did I know that a storm was coming. And in psychology, what happened in 2011 was there was a paper by a very interesting man by the name of Daryl Bem called Feeling the Future. It was published in a top psych journal and it was sort of about, let's just say ESP. And the reason the journal published it is not because we psychologists think ESP is a good thing, it's because this guy is such a good experimentalist and such a good writer that he knew how to follow all of the rules of publication in the best science journal and got his experiments to meet it and got his writing to meet it. And they said, if it meets all these standards, we need to publish it. Uh-oh, a lot of us were not happy. In 2011, we learned that Diedrich Stapo, a famous uh, psychologist from the Netherlands, had committed a bunch of fraud in his paper, totally making up the data. He's had, I forget, 54 or 56 of his papers retracted. And in 2011, we got this online publication, came out actually in 2012, of the best psychology article I've ever read. And if you ever want to read one and teach from one, uh, the Joe Simmons et al. paper, False Positive Psychology, shows you how we as scientists, with best intentions, without committing fraud, can do things 
that are wrong that'll end us end uh, up with us getting the wrong results. And these, they, well, later on we're learned to call questionable research practices. So, after these things happened, I started getting this deluge of articles about all these different things that were wrong in science. And it could feel something happening. And more and more publications came out. And this is how I started to feel. Like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Um, so I thought, OK, well, I'm, I'm trained as a psychologist. I actually have my undergraduate degree in philosophy. Incidentally, I'm from Wesleyan, which will only matter uh, for some people. But what I decided was it was time, right? I was in a position to do something, and I was going to take my shot. So here's what we did. Um, a couple of researchers, Hal Paschler and E.J. Wagenmakers, who had been doing a lot of kind of worrying about what was going on in the field, I said, OK, you guys, you're going to put together a special issue on the journal about what's going on now in science. And they invited eight people, eight invited articles. Actually, one of them was John. And so I thought, OK, we'll have a little half, a section, half a journal on that. We'll have some other regular articles. Well, before things were over, instead of a 100-page journal, we had 170 pages in that issue. Instead of you know, 10 authors, we had 120 authors. And the kinds of articles I had were not only the invited articles, but collected from the deluge of things people were writing. I unrejected some articles. I had previously rejected them the year before, going, eh, the field's not ready for it, eh, we don't have the data, saying, you know what, the time is now. I even bid for an article that I knew was going to another journal, and I said, hey, if you publish this in my journal, I'll give you a month of open access. No, I'll give you three months of open access. <laughs> and it turns out that the entire issue is open access. And the articles, although, some of them are dated. A lot of them really helped form the foundation of uh, the science movement. And so the articles did a bunch of things. They identified a lot of problems, you know, talking about is there really a replication crisis, and a lot of these other issues that John's mentioned. And they came up with um, various kinds of solutions, from how to teach replication to rewarding it. And one of the things that got discussed a lot was what journals can do. So. My main goal today is to talk a bit about all these things about that journals can do, but here we already did the first thing, how can journals help document the problems and raise awareness of the problems? We can get people doing meta-science, we can publish the meta-science, we can agree to publish different kinds of articles that we have published in the past, uh, tutorials, just to make people aware of what can happen. How do journals contribute to the problems, though? That's something that's interesting to look at when you are, in fact, an editor. Um, so let's think about why are there failures to replicate. So some of the failures to replicate may be the fault of the original researchers, right? They may be committing fraud. But not too many of us like to admit that many people are committing fraud, outright fraud, and perhaps they're not. But more likely, what some of them, what all of us are probably doing, is this notion of questionable research practices. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But that's the idea that you can be doing the wrong thing without necessarily intending to do so. On the other hand, a failure to replicate can be a fault of the replicator. They can have their own questionable research practices. They might have bad intentions. Or, oh my god, they might have some kind of incompetence. But a lot of these things fall in the middle. They could be the fault of one person, of both people, or actually of neither, neither of the parties. So there are things that happen by chance. Maybe the original paper happened by chance. Maybe the failure to replicate happened by chance. But we know there are things that we can do to reduce chance. For example, have a bigger data set, have a bigger population, try to reduce variability, in, in short, increase our power. Um, there might be what I call bad copy which is the problem that was just uh, sort of mentioned about methods and uh, data. If you're trying to replicate somebody else's study, you really need a good description of what they exactly did. Maybe the researchers didn't provide it. Maybe the, the replicators didn't really know how to fill in the blanks because they hadn't run a study like this before. And this is another thing, by the way, that journals can help ameliorate by asking for more, better, longer, more detailed um, descriptions of the methods or the data or the materials or the analysis. 
Another problem, of course, is that things have changed. Things have changed between the first study and the second study. And we don't know what that is, right? And maybe something about where it's happening or who it's happening or intervening things that have happened between them. But this, of course, provides a really interesting avenue for exploration. What is it that's changed and what is it that matters? But it, it temporarily screws up the ability to replicate, but it does pose an inter another interesting research question, usually. Okay, so we've all seen this, the beautiful, ideal, hypothetical, deductive model of science that we pretend that we believe in. Um, and we all know that when you get to the end, there's this great thing that might happen. You found out something interesting, you either decide to conduct another experiment or do you decide to publish. What happens when you decide to publish? Well, publication provides an incentive for all of us. We want to publish. If we get published, we can get a job, we can get tenure, we can get promoted, we can get fame, we can get students, we can get our next grant funded. All these kinds of reasons we want to uh, publish. But the interesting thing about publishing is it kind of has this back influence, right, on all these other things that we may be doing to get published. So let's think for a second about what do journals want. Well, hey, journals want to make money, right? If it's from your society, that's where your society is funded. If it's a private publisher, that's their business. Um, and how do they do that? Well, you want to make your journal famous. You want to get people to buy and read and cite the journal. So you want to publish important papers, novel papers, papers that clearly go from some nice, interesting hypothesis to a beautiful support of that hypothesis and lovely conclusion. You also don't want to spend too much money on your journal. You want to keep the article short. You don't want to spend a lot of money on reviewing, fact checking, and all that other kind of stuff. And all these decisions can lead to publications that are bad um, or incomplete or not really replicable. All right, but what do scientists want? Well, scientists want to get published, so this gives the opportunity to journals to use carrots and sticks to make science better. All right, John showed you a version of this wonderful, wonderful picture that has gotten filled in more and more over the years as we've identified uh, different ways that at different points in the research process, things can go wrong. So, uh, low statistical power, cherry-picking data, cherry-picking measures, uh, mining, all these different sorts of things uh, can contribute to researchers making decisions along the way because they want to come up with the best article possible. And lots of us were told along the way, you know, just pick your best data. Nobody wants to hear where it went wrong. Everybody only wants to hear where it goes right. Tell that story, not the story you had in your head originally, and that can lead into problems. So start at the beginning, right? Ner journals want novel data. Well, novel data distorts the literature. And here we have journals don't want to devote precious page space to replication studies, and if they do, replication studies are held to a higher standard. So what this is doing is distorting the field, distorting what has actually been published in the science. And what we're going to see is there's two different kinds of questions or problems. Distorting what's actually published, but then also what is published has been incentivized to perhaps be a little uh, sketchy. Another problem with novelty is, hey, if you come up with something new, like law of gravity, getting hit on the head by an apple, you're going to end up with a high impact paper. But if you're the one who just says, hey, oranges also uh, follow the law of gravity, you're not going to get it published in the most prestigious journal, and you're likely not to get it published at all. What are you really adding to the literature? So if you're a scientist and you think, ah, I have this great new hypothesis, it's beautiful, it's novel, they're going to love it, now I just need to get it published, right? What are you going to do? Well, one thing is you can improve your own luck. And you can do that by just running small samples. Now, the problem with running small samples, the good news is, for you, you increase your probability of actually getting a false positive. Hey, so you run a few seconds, and then you can publish it. You also increase your probability of getting a false negative, but then you know what you do? You just keep running more people until you get significant results, and then you publish it. Whoops, 
Maybe there's something a little sketchy going on there. But it sounds like good science. Um, you try a lot of things. You try a lot of independent variables, de variables dependent measures, and all those uh, different things. And you pick the good ones. You pick the ones that work to publish. So now you have a good story. And you know what? If you can't get your hypothesis to work because the data aren't following suit, well, then go with the data and change your hypothesis. And that, this is called harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. A psychologist talked about this a bunch of years ago. And of the big circle, I think this is one of the things that it's so easy to be guilty of and not even know that you're doing it because you believe something is there and you want to talk about it. Now, journals lead to this because uh, several different reasons. One is journals want to keep the methods short. Um, they, a, a while back, at least in psychology, said, you know what, we don't need this long method sections. We ought to be publishing things that are shorter. And it's very easy to cut down parts of your method. But what happens when you do that? Nobody can evaluate and replicate it. And somebody mentioned the sort of secret sauce of replication before. Of course you can't replicate my experiment. There's a secret incantation that you have to chance, that you have to chant, and I'm not telling it to anybody. Right? You just didn't put it in your method section. Maybe you were encouraged not to because it had to be shorter. Maybe um, you didn't want to, and maybe there just wasn't there just wasn't the room, or maybe you just didn't think about it. And one of the great things about technology that's really helping to reform science is that now there's room for this stuff. Your journal should not be saying you don't have room for the methods or the data or the analysis. You say, online, there's an infinite amount of space. We can do it. And more and more journals are doing things like this. Technology is really part of the solution here. Journals don't require dating sh data sharing or full material method sharing or code sharing. Again, it hurts the ability to evaluate. And I don't know about those, the rest of you who have, got, who have been peer reviewers, but the first few times I was asked to peer review, I was like, okay, I read the article, but I can't really know what they did. I don't see all the methods. I don't really know whether their analysis made sense or what the data looked like. What am I actually peer reviewing? And so when people talk about the failure of peer review to find things, well, it's in part because the peer reviewers don't have those things to find. It wasn't always available. And you know, let's try to make it more available so we can do a better job with peer review. And as John mentioned before, accentuate the positive. The journals want you to come up with nice stories about hypotheses that were confirmed. And through all the different disciplines, everybody's really, really good at that which, by the way, kind of means we're all good at predicting the future, right? Maybe that article was right all along that we can do that. Um, all right, so journals are providing some weird incentives to people. Um, and what we want to do is have journals change their incentives to make it the case that what's good for the scientists are also good for journals and science generally. So how can journals help reduce some of these problems of replicability in the future. Well, in uh, 2014, I got an email from Marsha McNutt, who at the time was the editor-in-chief of science and all the science journals. And we had a um, conference at the Center for Open Science in Charlottesville that involved about 40 people, uh, all different sorts of stakeholders from uh, mostly, the researchers were mostly social scientists, although there were some life scientists. There were head of societies, there were editors, there were publishers. And what we talked about eventually became this article, Promoting an Open Research Culture, which, hey, no conflict of interest, got published in science. But um, <laughs> what the article did was it put forth the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines. What the guidelines present are eight policy guidelines for increasing transparency and reproducibility of published research. And the interesting thing about it is because we had so many different stakeholders who had so many different values and views about what journals could or should do, it, the, the rules are agnostic to discipline. And disciplines can pick which ones they think would help implement best what's going on in their field. 
this, it's, it's kind of stepwise. Journalists can adopt different things from nothing at all to asking people to disclose some information, to requiring them to disclose some information, to having the information there and also verified. And it's modular. You can adopt some practices and not adopt other practices. So here are the eight standards of things that journals can address, the level one, level two, level three. So let me talk about these first, these transparency standards. What the sta transparency standards ask is for um, authors to, at level one, identify whether or not the data code materials are available in a public repository. They just ask that question. And people ask, say yes or no, and if yes, where? And so this is like a first step to making things transparent. And it, you know, it's hard to push some people to want to do this. I find it less hard to push people under 30 to want to do this than people over 30. But what's new with that? Okay. How, but how do you get people to actually do this? Why would anybody do this if it was just kind of optional? Well, one thing we learned is carrots, right? Not just sticks. One of our premier journals in psychology started giving badges for open science. So somebody who made their data open got a little badge with it when they published on the front page of the journal, on the front page of their publication, and it said, gave open data, gave open materials, or pre-registered, I'll get to that in a second. Thought, Wait, we're all grown-ups, what are badges gonna do? In fact, they work, because they signal to your colleagues that you are being open and transparent about your stuff, that you are not afraid of having people redo it and replicate it, that you're willing to talk about it, that you're really willing to engage in open science. Now here's some lovely data that from a couple of years after we started the badges. This is the journal Psychological Science that started having the badges. This is the proportion of people who uh, actually share data. And you can see that in psychological science it was going up and up and up once we gave them the badges. Here's the thing though, I mean this is people were um, saying that they were sharing the data. If you actually went in to see whether you could get the data, the 40% goes down a little bit. If you could actually use the data, if it was there with all the identifying variables and stuff, it went down a little bit. Okay, not perfect, but still a start. People saying that they're gonna do it and people willing to do it. So here are the three steps in this sort of thing. Right? The first one is just your journal adopts a policy authors must disclose action. Did you put it in a repository or not? Once you have your folks thinking, hey, maybe this is the right way to go, maybe you take the next step. Authors must share their data, their methods, their materials. Okay, panic, oh my God, I can't share my data. It's confidential, it's too big, it's too this, it's too that. Fine, if you can't do it, just explain why, right? So, one of the things people have always been worried about is that the replication police, or whatever they want to call us, are going to come in and create these rules, and it's going to stifle their science and make it impossible to do. And the answer is no. No one wants to stop you from doing your science. It's just, you know, it would help if we all did it a little better, shared a little more, made it a bit more transparent, like in the olden days. And so if you really can't share it, just tell us why. And that's fine. And then the third step would be the one that all of us really want, except for our own data, of course, is that some, the journal itself or some third party will verify, in the case of data, that it's actually there in the repository, that it's usable, and that it, in fact, will reproduce the findings presented in a paper. So pick your step. Right? Not all journals have to do the same thing. Society or a journal or an individual ed editor can define the standards that's appropriate for their field and for their journal. So what about the three things at the bottom? Well, John kind of got to many of these at the end. Study pre-registration, analysis pre-registration, and then replication and replication um, reports. So pre-registration refers to the idea that you have a time-stamped, read-only version of your research plan created before the study is done. And this increases credibility by specifying in advance what you're gonna do, how you're gonna collect the data, how the data is gonna be analyzed, 
What circumstances might occur where you might exclude some of your data? For example, in psychology, your students showing, the, the subject showing up drunk. You know, you want to specify that you might not include students like that. Um, and uh, pre-registration makes the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory work more clear. Um, there are many different definitions for pre-registration, and John went through these, so just the study existed, the hypotheses, the plan, a registered report. I'll talk more about some of them in a second. But in terms of confirmatory versus exploratory analysis, probably some of you have heard this story, that a guy goes driving past a barn, and he sees on the barn these beautiful targets, and in the middle of each one is the perfect arrow or the perfect bullet hole or something like that. So he stops and he talks to the farmer and he goes, wow, you're a great shot. To every single target, you hit exactly the center. And the guy says, oh, I didn't do that. First I took the shot and then I drew the target around it, <laughs> right? So confirmatory analysis is the one where the target's there, and you say, that's the target, I'm going to hit it. And you do it. You're a good shot. Your science is spot on. Exploratory analysis, post hoc analysis, p-hacking, whatever you want to, various things, is like the other one. It's like, I got these data. Let's see what story I can tell around it. And so what you get is with confirmation, you know, this is where traditional hypothesis testing fits in. Your goal is to minimize false positives. Your p-value is interpretable. You know, you had the target. How close did you get, get to the target? Um, and you can, you can think seriously about your effect size and the numbers you got relative to what it is that you predicted. But in the context of discovery, this exploratory analysis, Hey, exploratory analyses are great. Nobody wants to stop people from doing exploratory analysis. It's where we find out some very new things. But the p-values are meaningless because you put the point there and then you drew your hypothesis around it. Guess what? 96% of the time, if you're clever enough, you're going to find some significant p-value because you did it that way. So what pre-registration does is it just walls off one from the other. It just says, tell us what your, com what your uh, confirmatory uh, predictions and analysis were, and tell us what was exploratory, and we'll know how to evaluate that and take that into consideration. And maybe, you know, with the exploratory stuff, somebody next will run another study and make a prediction based on it and then do a confirmatory analysis. So, the problem, right, is that presenting exploratory results as confirmatory results increases publishability, increases uh, the very nice story, but it decreases credibility. Another thing that some journals are, are doing from the top is asking for pre-registration or replication. So level one, you can disclose whether your study was pre-registered, some journals will choose to allow replications, uh, you, uh, and they can say that we encourage replication. And pre-registration, um, particularly registered reports, can stop harking. And Chris Chambers, who wrote a book I will advertise later, uh, talks about how the, you know, if the study is accepted in advance, if you know your study is accepted, the incentive for authors to change from producing the most beautiful story to producing the most accurate one. That's what we want to be doing as scientists, right? The accurate story. And Dan Simons, who just started a new journal, some, issue, some of, the, uh, issue, uh, the articles went online last night from the first issue, talks about how registered reports eliminates the bias against negative results in publishing because the results are not known at the time of review. Okay, so what is this model that they're talking about? In registered reports, what you do is you develop some kind of idea, and you develop a study design, and then you submit it to a journal that takes registered reports. And people, reviewers there, think, are the hypotheses well-founded? Found, well are they worth addressing? Are they important? Are they novel? Whatever criteria they want. 
are the methods appropriate, proposed analysis able to address the hypotheses, and are there uh, controls, are there reason to believe that this is a fair test? Then you go out, you collect, you analyze your data. Um, if they say good enough, uh, if they say not good enough, you may have to do some things over. Uh, you go out, you connect your, collect your analysis you, data, you do your analysis, you write your report, and then they read it. And if they say, well, you followed the pr protocol, the controls succeeded, the conclusions are justified by the data, regardless of what the conclusions are, then we are going to publish it. Now, some of this, for those of us who completed dissertations, particularly in the empirical science, doesn't it sound like what you did when you wrote your dissertation? You came up with an idea, you said, here's what I'm gonna do, your committee said, okay, go do it. You had a contract with them. I said, if you did this and you did a good job doing this and you could explain what happened at the end, that you would get your PhD. It didn't really matter how the data turned out as long as it was an interesting problem and you addressed it well, right? So why not publish like that if that's the criteria that we have for really pushing science forward? Unfortunately, with our dissertations, we didn't all get to the published part, but this is a good way for science to proceed. So all these things solve different problems in the individual pieces and the individual, um, what researchers do and what researchers will do to get published. But how can we make researchers do better with journals? How can we make journals do better? That's the big question. So one thing we want to do is we want to make it easier for them to do it. Um, so the Center for Open Science will talk to you about your journal and say, what is it that you want to get from your journal? And help you craft the, the language uh, to tell your, the researchers who want to submit to your journal what it is that you want them to do, to do and what it is that you require them to do. Another way to make journals do better is peer pressure. So let's, let me tell you some of the other journals have, who have signed on to TOPS and who are actually moving a bit up, not as fast as we might like, but hey, in this business, any increase is a good improvement. And this includes the whole science, all the science journals and the nature journals are all starting to do this and moving up in some different ways. But there's other things you can do. You can belong to a society. They could take top-down organizational action on the journals that they control. I've seen individual editors. You know, pushing up standards is not usually frowned upon. Right? So individual editors, even within bigger societies, have been asking for more stringent standards. There's pressure from reviewers. So I don't know about you, but you know, I've been a reviewer on a lot of papers, and sometimes I get a paper, and I don't like doing what I had to do 20 years ago and say, wait, I can't really evaluate this because I don't have enough information there. I say, I write back and I say, I am not gonna review for you unless I can see the full methods and at least the portion of data that's relevant to this paper. If they say no, I say, hey, I'm going out to party. And if they say, yes, we'll get it, you know, maybe somebody's starting to think about how to make the science there better. Um, and if they got enough reviewers to say this and to refuse to review, if you didn't get that stuff, the journal would be rethinking their policies. And then, of course, pressure from researchers, from readers, from authors, that this is stuff that you want. If you don't like that, what you can do, start a new journal yourself. So advances in methods and practices in psychological science, as I said, first published uh, online, some of its things last night, including an article about why researchers don't want to be doing a lot of this stuff. Um, comprehensive Results in Social Psychology is an all-registered report journal. So in order to get a paper there, you have to go through that process. I have a few pet peeves about what's not happening, because I think really the movement is doing well. I think what we're doing is we're making better bricks, better individual uh, experiments, better individual papers. We're not necessarily connecting the field well enough for me. I'd like us to stop losing information. I'd like us to connect our science, right? Because science isn't just one study at a time. Science is the agglomeration of studies and developing theories, and we need to get better at that. I have some more detailed recommendations for that. 
but that's not really uh, the point here. So I think a lot of these things address the various types of failures to replicate. As I said, uh, you know, I'm not normally an optimist, but I really am an optimist about what's going on now. A uh, famous, but a person I'm not allowed to name here, person said, um, this, what's going on now is a success. It's a success of using technology, changing incentives to implement the timeless values of science. And I would also like to add, I think it's a chain, change in demographics. I think it's um, adding younger people who are more savvy with technology, who are more into sharing, maybe a little too much guys, but who are more into sharing, uh, <laughs> tempting us, the older ones of us, with the values that we know are there. Like it should be open, it should be accessible. How is it that we went wrong? I think that good things are happening. Um, so thank you, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Professor Spellman, for a very illuminating lecture. Um, I would like now to open the floor up to questions. Uh, again, we have microphones in front, and for those of you on the web, please send your questions in, and it'll be passed forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, it's Doug Yee. I'm a medical oncologist and the Cancer Center Director. So I wanted to get your sense of what do you mean by open data, and I'm asking this as a clinical trialist. Right. So as a clinical trialist, most of our patients sign a consent that says right. no one can look at your data. Correct. Um, so if I, and I also edited, co-edited a, a journal, if a, jur a reviewer right. came back and said, I'd like to see the CT scans where this person claimed the response rate, what's, how do we, the data will have right. to be manipulated at some level to satisfy the reviewer's yeah. request. Right, that's, that's right. So, you know, why wouldn't you, what, what would be one of your, among people's excuses for not sharing data? And one of them is, because it's identifiable, and we have promised our, our subjects anonymity. Now, I'm not sure you can do this with an actual scan, but if you're supposedly, suppose you are doing a study on a, on a school, and it's all you know, written stuff, there's lots of ways to be able to de-identify things. And now, um, we're developing more and more algorithms to be able to sort of mix up the data a little bit so that it's not all consistent, even though all the numbers are there. It reduces your ability to do some kinds of correlations, but not your uh, main effects, if, depending on what analysis you're doing, um, so that you couldn't, couldn't identify people even if you tried. So you need a consent form that says, will not be released, you know, will not be released in full form, maybe de-identified and all that, and you get that on the consent side, and then you can do all these different sort of data manipulations. But some data, and probably like genomics, will likely never be that kind of releasable. There are other ways, um, you know, perhaps to allow it only to go to the journal, only to not be downloaded, only be used online, and that kind of thing which, you know, IRBs are working on now to be able to do that. Hi, um, I'm a research technician in the neuroscience department. I love all of this, <laughs> but um, I'm wondering uh, how does, uh, how, how do the top guidelines affect the timeline of getting published and even of getting research approved, like your, your protocol approved? Um, I don't know about getting your protocol approved. The only thing it seems to me, well, the, um, making data open could be a problem. That's something you might want to work out with your IRB. The other things really shouldn't be, um, making uh, your methods open and your analysis plan open. Um, and it, you know, it's funny, a lot of this seems like it's adding a lot of extra work. But again, I, I want to push something that the Center for Open Science is doing, <laughs> where it makes, it has a lot of tools available to us to be able to do all this stuff, to upload these things, to share all these things. And one of the great pitches they usually say is, remember that study you did 10 years ago with that graduate student who left your lab and now it's really relevant? What do you do when you want to find those data? And, uh, right, a lot of people are laughing because we have that problem. Wouldn't it be nice if we had it in a place that was persistent with a persistent identifier? Wouldn't it be nice if we had the notes? They, they, it comes with a wiki that 
every time you do something new, it gets updated and it tells you, it gets time stamped. Oh my God, wait, was that version one? Or was that version two? Was the one that says final version really the final version or did I do some more after it, right? We make those mistakes and they so they provide these tools to help us with that. So even though it sounds like a lot of extra work, in some ways planning for it all beforehand kind of makes some of it easier and certainly easier to save and share and remember. Please. I was wondering if you had any comments on how to promote um, civil discourse about these reproducibility <laughs> issues or how can we keep the focus on the science and not on the reputation of the researcher, how we could be peacemakers in the reproducibility war. Right. Um, this is why I was part of part of why I was pushing that Simmons article so much. You know, we don't want people to get hostile. We don't want them to think we're attacking them individually. We just want to say, look, let's, like I said, let's go back to the values that we had. If somebody wants to rep try to replicate your stuff, be flattered, right? So, I mean, I've, I've spoken to so many senior researchers who said, well, I've never tried to replicate anybody else's stuff. I go, really? And they say, yeah, never. And I said, well, you get a new grad student into the lab. They say, hey, I was reading up on this and this and this. What do you think about an extension that goes this way? What's the first thing you say? Go back and see if you can replicate the original study, and then we'll take it from there. So we have to convince people that they're... It, you know, it's not bad intentions that necessarily leads to people want to replicate. They should be flattered, sometimes. Um, and that people who fail to replicate aren't necessarily incompetent, and there's lots of reasons that somebody, and, and it's not always that they did something wrong, and it, it, it yeah, it's got to be more civil. But I think, you know, I think like so many things, and I, and I call what's happened um, a revolution, but I, I think like so many things that, have, that go on, you know, at the beginning you kind of have two camps, mostly distinguished by age. Um, and one saying, hey, this is the way we've always done it, we've become famous, we want to keep it this way, and the other say, you know, we really want to change it and we want really to move, move things along. But when you're at loggerheads, each group char um, stereotypes, characterizes, set up, sets up a straw man from the other side. And really, you know, they have to know that, no, we don't mean every single one has to do, every, every single person has to do every single, single thing. And they have to know, you know, no, we don't think everybody in the past was a liar and a cheat. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to you can end. Like, Want me to take the last one? One more short one. Okay, yeah. just a short one. It's Let's pretty short. Um, I'm just questioning what is being done to address the um, entities that dole out the rewards for being published. Are they looking at... Um, expectations of reproducibility, or are they just looking at quantity? This, so, right, so, <laughs> this is a problem. Uh, John, can you solve this one? So here's the thing. Right now, we're looking at what people are doing, right, in the, when they're submitting and what the journals are doing. But in a way, we don't really care what they're doing. What we really care is, ultimately, is this gonna end up with better science? And so that needs to get measured, but exactly how and when, it's a little bit down the line. I think it's a matter of faith, but if we have faith in science, right, it ought to work. Thank you. <laughs>